The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. We'll repeat the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who in thy wisdom and goodness has appointed the office of rulers and parliaments for the welfare of society and the just government of men, we beseech thee to behold with thy abundant favor us thy servants whom thou hast been pleased to call to the performance of important trust in these islands. Let thy blessing descend upon us here assembled and grant that we may treat and consider all matters that shall come under our deliberation in so just and faithful a manner as to promote thy honor and glory and to advance the peace, prosperity, and welfare of these islands and of those whose interests thou hast committed to our charge. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. two members that are absent today, the Honorable Speaker, Dennis Lister, and Mr. Cole Simons, the Honorable Member Cole Simons, who are abroad. Can we stand and observe a minute of silence? Members of the Brown family, the Honorable Premier, David Burke, the Honorable Opposition Leader, Mr. Cannonier, Members of Parliament, former Speaker, the Honorable Kenneth Howard Randolph Horton, former Premier, Dame Jennifer Smith, and Sir John Swan. Good morning. The one thing that can be said about the weather is that it is unpredictable. In the wink of an eye, a hurricane could uproot a massive tree from its soil and solid foundation. This could be stated is what happened to the House of Assembly with the sudden passing of our dear brother, the Honorable Walton Brown, JPMP. Brother Walton was a staunch advocate for Bermuda's sovereignty and he dedicated most of his adult life trying to make this a reality for the rest of us. 
of those soft-spoken at most times, Walton was able to convince the inconvincible that Bermuda would be able, not be able to reach its full potential until the Union Jack was lowered and Bermuda's own flake was hoisted. W.E.B. Du Bois, a prolific and influential African-American scholar and activist said, the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. It is a well-known fact that Walton's fervent desire for an independent Bermuda was evident in the many speeches he made on the floor of the House of Assembly and in the community as a whole. None of us were surprised when Brother Walton was appointed to the Senate in 2007 by his cousin and party colleague, the Honorable Dr. Ewart Brown. After all, Walton had paid his dues by serving the party in various capacities since 1983 when he returned to Bermuda from college. He was elected to Parliament in 2012 and again in 2017. And then he was appointed as the Minister of Home Affairs by the Honorable Premier David Burke. Walton had a calming spirit, even under immense pressure. And in particular, what I admired about him was that once he took a stance on a particular issue, you could not get him to waver from his position. He was as solid as a rock. He never criticized you for your beliefs and views. Another characteristic that I admired about Walton was he spoke very clearly and succinctly. One did not need a dictionary to understand his delivered speeches. The honorable member had many attributes. The staff of the House of Assembly described him as kind, humble, easy to talk to, thoughtful, impactful, sincere, resolute, and an avid listener, and a fierce champion for the rights of Bermudians. One staff member in particular recalls that Mr. Brown always had a twinkle in his eye and a smile when he spoke about controversial issues in the chamber, while at the same time, it, he did not diminish the importance of the issue. We at the House of Assembly, together with the legislative staff, are deeply saddened that the honorable member whom I describe as a first amongst equals and possessing acumen will be no longer be gracing us with his humble presence. On behalf of myself, the Honorable Speaker, Mr. Dennis Lister, MPs, members of parliament, and the legislative staff, I would like to extend my deepest sympathies and condolences to the Brown family, in particular his mother, Ms. Barbara Brown. Thank you. At this time, I call on the President of the Senate, the Honorable Member, Ms. Joan Dillis. Brown family, former premiers, members of this Honorable House and the Senate. This is a somber occasion as we are gathered to pay tribute to a colleague and fellow parliamentarian MP Walton Brown, JRJP MP, who by being multi-talented has given so much to Bermuda in his short life. I am referring to his being a lecturer in history and political science, a researcher, news commentator, journalist, author, and politician, first as a senator from 2007 to 2010, and later as a member of parliament from 2012 to present, and who held as a member of cabinet ministerial portfolios. I had the privilege of being associated with MP Walton Brown years ago when he was a lecturer at Bermuda College and earned research associates. I was then involved with several substance abuse agencies and at that time, MP Brown was conducting research for the National Drug Agency, 
which was to assess drug use among school children. His lament at that time was that he, he was only allowed to survey the public schools, which meant that the results were inadequate for developing an island-wide substance abuse education program for schools. I'm pleased to say that that has changed today. Subsequent to leaving Bermuda College, M.P. Brown became more focused on the issues facing Bermuda. He did not have to base his comments on a purely academic perspective but could, could, could then take a political view on what he believed was the best way forward. He was now in his element. M.P. Brown was an eloquent spokesperson. He could speak most knowledgeably on any subject, but one that was dear to him was the land grab situation in Bermuda, which propelled him to try to achieve justice for Bermuda and its people. He would often speak to that topic as indeed the right of Bermudians to manage their own affairs. Independence was therefore his quest, which was informed by history, data, and his own experiences. Mr. Acting Speaker, members of this Honorable House and the Senate and his family, it is often stated that Bermuda's young people need leaders who they can aspire to. I submit that Walton Brown, JP, MP, is one such leader who was humble, never dogmatic, used his academic, administrative, and experiential knowledge to inform his decisions. Were these qualities or traits to be emulated by our young people, then MP Walton Brown's dream of an independent Bermuda will be realized. MP Walton Brown has done his work. We as parliamentarians now need to ensure that our young people follow in his footsteps. Thank you. Well. At this time, I call on the Honorable Premier of Bermuda, the Honorable David Burke. Madam President and members of the Senate, Mr. Acting Speaker, and fellow members of the House of Assembly, former premiers, members of the legislature, members of the civil service executive, and most especially, the Brown family. On each occasion that an honorable member rises to speak in this honorable house, or when a senator beckons for the recognition of the president to speak from their appointed seat, that member embarks on the execution of a sacred trust established in centuries-old traditions of parliamentary democracy. I term it a sacred trust because whilst it may be our voices that pronounce the words, we are but instruments entrusted to be the voice of the people. Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker, a profound voice of the people has been silenced by death. In the cold symbolism of this day, an empty seat declares that Walton Brown will no longer grace us with his presence or his thoughtful and reasoned arguments in debate. Madam President and Mr. Acting Speaker, at the core of Walton Brown was principle. His beliefs were not subject to negotiation and they could not be watered down by the persistence of those who may have opposed him. Over several years, the only concession that I saw him make to an opposing argument was that wry smile which seemed to say, nice try, but no chance. There was a fundamental consistency to his life's work in every arena. The issue of Bermuda's self-determination and ultimate sovereignty was seldom far from his lips. He would engage the staunchest critic of Bermuda's ultimate step and methodically dissect their misgivings so at the end of the discussion, another mind was at least open to the possibility that we could properly take our place among the family of nations. With his perseverance in securing converts to sovereignty for Bermuda, imagine if he had chosen the path of religion his church surely would have been full. Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker, 
Walton Brown was a teacher, an author, an historian, an advocate, and he was our friend. The truth about Bermuda can be uncomfortable, and we have become experts in masking inconvenient facts. However, the true measure of our friend and colleague is to be found in his writings, his lectures, and his ordinary discourse, for he refused to cloud the truth about Bermuda. Who among us remembers hearing Walton shout? Who among us can recall a moment when he spoke in anger or with malice? None, because he never did. He spoke directly to the point of conviction in words that were seldom sweetened sufficiently for most tastes. However, truth is rarely succulent. In his seminal work, Bermuda and the Struggle for Reform, Race, Politics, and Ideology, we gain insight as to how the unwavering Walton Brown was forged. In his own words, he says, and I quote, it began around the Sunday morning codfish breakfast table, mostly with my parents, siblings, and oftentimes my irrepressible paternal grandfather, W.G. Brown. I sat there mesmerized by the stories told about Dr. Gordon, that Jack Tucker, Dr. Barbara Ball, Lois Brown Evans, and Ottawell Simmons. Tales of power, the struggle for rights and justice, and the sacrifices made, all resonated with me long before I could really appreciate their meaning. The passion with which Bermuda's history was relayed to me during these impromptu classes, punctuated with a firm slap on the table to accentuate each point, told me these events were transformative for my parents and for Bermuda." End quote. From those early formative days at that breakfast table emerged a champion of social justice in Bermuda. Every movement needs one who will keep the record and ensure that the story is accurately told. Walton's determination to chronicle the truth about our island made him that record keeper. He remembered and recorded so that we would not forget. Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker, as honorable members today raise their voices in tribute to this fallen servant of the people, there is no need to shy away from those things on which we may have disagreed. Without betraying the constitutional secrecy of cabinet, it will not surprise anyone to know that even the principle of collective responsibility was tested during Walton's tenure in the room. He never abandoned his principles, and we, his former cabinet colleagues, are better for having been challenged by him as we sought to execute on the mandate provided to us by the people. Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker, in a telegram to Winston Churchill after reclaiming Ethiopia from Italian forces in 1941, Emperor Haile Selassie said, we have finished the job, what shall we do with the tools? I would adapt the Emperor's quotes in this way, Walton finished his job, what shall we do with the tools? Walton Brown's voice may be silent, but the tr tools he left us are sharp, well-oiled, and relevant for use in lifting up the people of this country. His legacy is one of truth, one of social justice, and one of an undying commitment to sovereignty for Bermuda. In the African tradition, we might say that he has joined the ancestors. To his family, especially his mother, his sons, and his siblings, this transition is hard. It was untimely and it was unexpected. But if there is any comfort you can draw from all that surrounds you at this moment, know that the man you knew as son, father, 
and brother now joins the ranks of those who made making Bermuda better their life's work. In that, you should be proud, and we join you with we join with you in mourning his loss, but also in celebrating his amazing life. Thank you, Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker. The next voice you'll hear the opposition leader, the Honorable Craig Kennedy. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. An acknowledgement to our President, Senate, our former premiers, Dame Lewis, Swan, our former Speaker of the House, Horton, to the Brown family. It's a pleasure to see you here. And on behalf of the entire OBA family, we mourn with you. To the Premier, the Progressive Labour Party, to all of the honored members here, MPs. This is a devastating time. And as I rode in this morning, I looked up, it's still outside, completely still. I believe that this time is more of a time of reflection than actual words. One thing that I have learned through life and continue to with the passing of our good friend, the Honorable Walton Brown, is that death is the reason why we find meaning in life. An understated man, in many ways, calm, very collected. His demeanor, in many ways, might not have stood out amongst the crowd. But at the very moment he spoke, eight years ago when I had the opportunity to actually sit down with him and talk with him, I realized how articulate and smart he was. As we reflected upon the news that we received this week, I realized that this great stature of a man across the divide of this room sought what was in a room for a better Bermuda. And why do I say that? Because even in the OBA, we have members who are devastated by this death and probably can't even come to words to express how they feel. As I walked in this morning, I could see in those eyes that I made contact with that pain. As I watched the Brown family come in, I recognized that Bermuda, Bermuda, has lost a man that cared even with those who may have been his pundit. Articulate, smart, yet I could approach him at any time, any time, and sit with him and discuss the beauty of the island that we serve and what was the best way to serve it. When you're asked to speak at a moment like this here, the first thing you say, what do you say? What is it that I can say? And that's why I believe that this is a time for us to reflect on what's most important in life. Walton actually took out the time when I got involved. He sought me out, showing that he cared about his fellow brothers, to understand them, to know them and to also give opportunity to get to know him. I will forever be grateful for the family that brought up such a man. The OBA will forever be grateful for the stance and the positions 
that he took. Because in every deliberation that we had, he always deliberated out of respect. This man deserves every honor possible that we can give him as a fellow colleague. And so my prayer as we go out throughout this time and as we continue to figure out how we deal with this passing and how we mourn, let us not remember, I'm sorry, let us not forget that his life lives on through us. May we forever remember this was a child of God. This was a man who was born in Bermuda and cared about all of us. May we continue to mourn out of respect for the family and rever and reflect on the beauty of such a man. I now call on other members of the legislature. The chair recognize the honorable member, Levita Foco. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Uh, I do rise with a sad heart. This morning, Walton Forrest was a schoolmate. In fact, the class of 1977, uh, Kim Bragg, I think, um, a piece of history because I think it is the only time in history that three graduating members of that class, the Honorable Walton Brown, MP Weeks, and myself, not only just sat in Parliament together, but we sat in Cabinet together. Uh, I don't know if any Cabinet can speak of that same uh, type of history. I will say then, on learning of Walton's death, the very first image that came to my mind was right back there at Barclay, and it was the image of Walton, and I always remembered this of Walton, bellowing out the words of Prince Aeschylus in the play Romeo and Juliet. He carried out that part with so convincingly that uh, it made me, it, it just captured, that was captured always. And I, at times, would speak to Walton about that, remember when you were in the play? And it stayed with me, and I think I understand now why. Because Prince Aeschylus was responsible for the peace within Verona in that play, Romeo and Juliet. And the way in which he meted out justice as the prince, he was very much to the point, as people have said, Walton was, and yet he was still fair because at a time where people were getting murdered in the streets of Verona, he still found a way to ensure that in the end, when he meted out punishment, that it was done fairly. So instead of sentencing Romeo, for instance, to death, he banished him, he exiled him forever because given his behavior was one that was in response to other murders, he felt that that was the just way of handling that situation. And I believe in watching a Walton who I felt was the most compelling actor in that play because again, you couldn't, you thought that it was him, in particular him as in Prince Aeschylus, and not Walton Brown acting. I understand that it was just a foretelling of all that 
Wold and Brown would be. And we've heard those words echoed here today. He was a fierce champion for justice. He was a fierce champion for the rights of all. He was a champion for the underdog. And he worked tirelessly to try and bring about a change within our society that would render us to what he believed only justice could be realized in, and that was in the state of sovereignty. And it is for us, those who continue while he is no longer, to pick up that baton and ensure that one day we do have a just and most democratic society. Because without true sovereignty, I dare say that democracy will never be, not to the state that it's supposed to be. And so in speaking to Walter's honor, I do have to say this, that Walton, the one thing that he, he did not suffer very well at all. He did not suffer stupidity and he did not suffer ignorance. He had very little tolerance for that. And most of the time that Walton were, did sit in the House of Assembly, I can say that we sat side by side, both in the, uh, in the opposition and when he was in cabinet, our seats were side by side. Um, I enjoyed Walton sitting beside me, especially when I was the VIP. I purposely sat him beside me <laughs> because I did enjoy his temperament. He, he was a calm-natured person, but often if you saw Walton leave the house, what most people did not know is that, at least when he was sitting beside me, if he thought that nonsense was being spewed out. Again, because he was someone that did not tolerate ignorance, he would find a way to absent himself from the chambers. And I would say, Regan is like, LaVita, I am not sitting here for this. Get it in the kitchen, I'll get a cup of tea. <laughs> he didn't, he did not suffer stupidity or ignorance. And I, I can say for those of his true classmates, and some are sitting in the gallery, I think that they can attest to that even more so than I, because they sat in class with him, not just at the great Barclay Institute. They also sat in class with him at West Pembroke, and, and they knew him well. In fact, uh, th some of those who sit here today, today were a thousand percent behind him when he chose to step forward to run as a parliamentarian. I don't want to say proper because then the, the, it would, um, I guess if you will, I'll use that common word, uh, put shade on the Senate and no, he, he did not just use his senatorial position. He took to the streets and thought that his role would be better served by representing people. And so he threw his head in the ring and did just that. And, and in so doing, did secure a seat as in the, in the lower house as a member of parliament. And I think Walton did those 
who knew him closely and more intimately. He did them extremely proud because he put one more feather in his cap in, in that being true to who he was, he did not just speak from the sidelines. He stood for the rights of people in this honorable house and made certain to advance their wishes, their concerns, and he continued his fight on their behalf and in honor of his family for a just and fair Bermuda for all. I am eternally grateful for much of the knowledge that he imparted to all of us and I definitely will take his baton and try to continue his fight and our fight in the same vein that he would want us to do and that Bermuda needs us to do. Thank you, family, for sharing Walton with us. I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Before I recognize the next speaker, Minister, you want to come take your seat? The chair recognizes the opposition leader, the Honorable Leo Scott. Good morning. All protocol haven't been established. the news of Walton's death. My first thought was, where is Kim? I have to find Kim because anybody that knows Walton or Kim knew that those two were joined at the hip. And I knew that if I was devastated by the news, that she had to be completely heartbroken. I was finally able to speak to Wayne Ferber, who told me that he was with Kim. And while she was distraught, she was okay. And I talked to her that evening. I can't tell you when or how Walton and I met. He just kind of morphed into my life and remained there as a subtle presence. I could call Walton at six in the morning or 11 o'clock at night and he would take my call. And if he wasn't available, he would always return my call. And he would always call and say, M.P. Scott? And I'd say, M.P. Brown, how are you today? He was always there. What people may not know is in 2016, when we had the immigration issue, when the OVA was in power, during the time of the protest, for the four or five days that that protest went on, Walton and I talked every single day with a view to trying to find a resolution, to try to find a meeting of the minds of the people who were protesting and the decisions that were made by the OBA. My position is and has always remained that immigration reform is necessary, but it's the process and the need to communicate and educate people about the things that you're doing. Thank you. And Walton and I agreed on that point. And I don't believe that it is by accident that I am now a member of the Bipartisan Committee for Immigration Reform. Walton was an astute politician who was open, honest, and easy to talk to. Mm -hmm. 
While you may not have shared the same views, he always listened, always. I've seen tributes from various friends of Walton who have known him for 50 years or more, and I haven't had that opportunity. But I'm grateful that I did have an opportunity and for the time that we spent together, for the knowledge that he shared. Walton was an iron fist and a velvet glove. He was a valued friend and his passing leaves a huge void in both our public life and in my life personally. In 2013, I had the privilege of awarding him the National Literary Award for nonfiction for his book. He was an articulate parliamentarian who stood set steadfastly for his friends and for his party. <laughs> Benedict Greening did a review of London, of uh, Walton's book, and one of the things he said was, he was a man who was able to find the difficult balance between polemical argument and balanced analysis. And to me, that is the definition of Walton. I express my condolences to the family and thank you for sharing him with us. And I pray that his soul rests in peace. And if you indulge me, Mr. Deputy Speak. I you recognize the Honorable Minister Wayne Keynes. If it pleases you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, Madam President of the Senate, former premiers, Dame Jennifer Smith, Sir John Swan, Honorable Premier, members of Parliament, Senators, and the family of Walton Braun, I say good morning. <clears throat> Tuesday in Cabinet, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we received the news, there was shock, we were stunned, there were cries, there were screams in the room. We sat in a malaise and hugging each other and consoling this, uh, each other in the midst of our loss. Shortly thereafter, our colleagues and wives started to pour into the cabinet building as we sat there consoling each other. It hit me that we are family. We sat in the room grieving the loss of our brother. Our beloved Walton is the sixth PLP member of parliament to die whilst in the service of the people of Bermuda since 1998. Over the last 48 hours, that has hit me hard. It's caused me to reflect on my life. It has caused, caused me to reflect on the work that we do here in the House of Assembly. Yesterday, MP Jamal Simmons and I, we were discussing this, and we were asking each other, is it for the pay? An MP salary averages 55K per annum. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's not for the money. We pondered, is it for the fame, the adulation? One week, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they'll lay palm trees in the street and cry, hail, king of the Jews. The very next week, the same people yell out, crucify him, crucify him. Mr. Speaker, it is not for the fame. It is not for the adulation. Why do we do what we do, Mr. Speaker? The CC meetings, the Central Committee meetings, the caucus meeting, the campaign committee meetings, the subcommittee meetings, the bipartisan uh, committee meetings, the branch meetings, the community meetings. Why, Mr. Speaker, why do we do this? I was forced to look at 
our beloved Walton's life. It was simple, and it is simple, service. I read the tributes from the students at Bermuda College online, and they were talking about the impact that he had in their lives, and they laid tribute to the places that they are now and how they ascended, and the impact that his class, that his leadership, that his mind, how it transfigured and transformed their minds and their lives. They spoke of the mentorship that he gave them in their time at Bermuda College and how it had a long-term impact, how he challenged their views and juxtaposed his thinking and melded with their thinking to allow them to come out their myopic views and their narrow-minded views and have a global perspective. That was his gift of service. Mr. Deputy Speaker, pedagogy is the method of teaching an academic concept. While Walton's pedagogy, through his research and through his lecturing and through him being an author and through him being a research, he gave you information, Mr. Speaker. He allowed you to form your own opinion, oft times a dissenting opinion. He did this whilst never becoming churlish, angry, and disrespectful. Something that I took from him sitting beside him in the Senate and for almost two years sitting beside him weekly in cabinet meetings. I learned that you can have an opposing view and that you can have a viewpoint that is totally diametrically opposed and you didn't have to be nasty. You didn't have to be disrespectful and that you can still have a healthy relationship with someone that you had an opposing view with. We had conversations about his views on Palestine, his burning desires and understandings and views on human rights, and can we forget independence? Oftentimes the aforementioned topics were not something that was sitting on all fours with the mainstream ideology in our community. I was then forced to look deeper at Wotan, the man his, the pedagogy of his person, his teaching style, his resolute determination, his respect for others. And Mr. Speaker, I believe that becomes the bedrock of his legacy. A man that stood, in other words, you must stand. You must serve your community and the sacrifice that he made for this community. We, seal, we soon will meander into by-election mode, Mr. Speaker. That is the legacy that we must now continue to go forward for that. A legacy of standing for that which is right. A legacy of service to the people of Bermuda and the ability to sacrifice for your country. To Mother Brown and to the Brown family, we mourn with you. And we stand with you at this difficult time. Even though your sons are not present, your father's legacy will shine brightly through his work. And he should always be kept deeply ensconced in your heart. To my colleagues, we often are forced in the public eye to maintain our composure to deal with loss and to deal with hurt. This is no different. We will get through this. We have a work to do. I will paraphrase Frost. The woods are cold, they're dark and deep, places to go and promises to keep. Many miles to go before we can sleep. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honorable Member Michael Weeks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Mr. Speaker, I rise to my feet, like my colleagues before me, on a somber and surreal note. Um, just a few short days ago, Mr. Speaker, one week to be exact, I stood and shared a tribute at the funeral service of one of my former Barker Institute friends and classmates, Mr. Chris Davis. And here, 
just one week later, sharing a tribute to another one of my Barclay Institute alumnus and parliamentary colleague, Mr. Walton Braun, JP, MP. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Ms. Acton Speaker, it is definitely surreal. You may have heard on this past Wednesday when on Magic 102, they played an interview of our dear departed brother, and I think it's in 2014. He is speaking of comprehensive immigration reform. Well, after he finished speaking, and um, they had, you know, the question and answer that listeners can call in, Mr. Acton Speaker, the same Chris Davis called in, and the two of them had a spirited debate about the state of immigration in Bermuda and a few other things. Because as much as they had difference of opinion, being former Barclayites, they were friends. I had to stop for a minute, Mr. Speaker, and realize that two of my contemporaries have passed in such a short space of time. And hearing this conversation made me reflect on what their conversations will be like way up yonder when the two of them start to get at each other on different issues. The Honorable Member Walton Brown, Jr., JPMP, was such a knowledgeable man. His commentary was principled and piercing. And we've already heard that as a former lecturer at the Bermuda College, he brought that persona to this honorable house. And I, and I personally always admired how he always made his position clear when he got up on his feet. What a loss, Mr. Acton Speaker, to this country and to this parliament. I mentioned that we attended the Barclay Institute at the same time. We knew each other, but we were in different circles. My first real encounter with the Honorable Member was one summer in the early 80s. We were both at home during our summer break from our respective universities. But by chance, we were, we were visiting our same mutual friend uh, Mr. Peter Ferber, at the same time, and we had a spirited debate about none other than Bermuda becoming independent. That's way back when we were 21, 22 years of age. I never forgot this conversation, and he soon became a public figure, and I always followed and admired his steadfastness on various issues. But when we became political colleagues, Mr. Acton Speaker, we talked about that discussion and how our positions and country has remained the same. The travesty that more than 30 years later, our country is still not independent. Since April of this year, by chance and by circumstance, or by circumstance, we were seated next to each other in the house until we moved to this present location. This gave us the opportunity to talk more often, sometimes serious and sometimes not so serious. He had a sincere love and fearless commitment to the people of this island. And I firmly believe, Mr. Acting Speaker, that we cannot talk about independence for Bermuda and what that means without mentioning the late Walton Brown Jr. JPMP. Just a story, Mr. Speaker. In July of this year, I gave a speech during motion to adjourn on the then upcoming Gay Pride Parade. While I was on my feet, he knocked my foot up a few times. <laughs> he was on one side, you on the other. 
Ms. Saxon Speaker. But when I sat down, he leaned over and said to me, good speech, but I support the parade. In his usual calm manner, this is another example of his steadfastness that I and others have already spoke of. He had his position, he respected yours, and you couldn't sway him, no matter how good a speech was. But Mr. Acton Speaker, we are giving him a state funeral, but what we should be doing is draping his casket with an independent Bermuda flag. And since we are not independent, I implore everyone, let's honor our fallen colleague by pursuing independence with a vigor once and for all. My heartfelt condolences to his very close-knit family, his mother, sons, his brothers, his sisters, and his extended family and friends to his constituency in C-17 who has lost a true stalwart. I send my condolences. As I take my seat, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Acting Speaker, as I remember the honorable member as a lifelong soldier for social justice, there's a verse in the Barclay Institute school song which to me encapsulates our dearly departed brother. I have not been blessed with an angelic voice like my honorable colleague, Mr. Speaker, in C, in C6. But um, here I go, Mr. Speaker. Only those Barclayites would know this verse. <laughs> For we owe you such a debt that we never can forget how you loyally played your part. Sleep in peace, Walton. Thank you. The Acting Deputy Speaker recognized the Honorable Member Michael Dunkley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That's a tough act to follow. And thank God the Honorable Member had some colleagues who support him in the last part. <laughs> Protocol already haven't been established, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Condolences to the Brown family, to the PLP, and to the many friends that our former colleague had. Mr. Deputy Speaker, one's passing when expected is certainly a very tough pill to swallow. It's never easy. You're always lost for reasons and understanding. One's unexpected passing is perhaps the most humbling shock that any human being can have in their world. You're in a state of disbelief you search for answers, you look for meaning in life, and certainly you look for comfort as you try to get that understanding. So I can't imagine the pain and suffer and the thought that the family had over the past couple of days. So on behalf of my family, to your family, our deepest prayers and blessings as you soldier forward. Now, everyone knows that Walton and I always sat on different sides of the aisle. But I always had the highest level of respect for the former minister. It's been just over 22 years since I was blessed to be first elected into the legislature. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, in my view, I've seen it become more acrimonious. I've seen it become more divisive at times. I've seen it become less respectful at times. I've seen it lose some of our friendship and fellowship at times. But the former member was not like that. 
One of the first things that always struck me about Walton, and the Honorable uh, Minister from Constituency 14 referred to it, he was never personal. He was usually very controlled, and he was generally well prepared every time he stood to his feet. And that was the same if you bumped into him onto the street. It was clear that he took his responsibility seriously. It was clear that that responsibility was carried with him through his daylight and the nighttime hours. For that, I always respected Walton's approach. Because as you know, Deputy Speaker, in this honorable place, we can get carried away during debates. We can get very emotional. And often we can regret some of the things that we say. Walton wasn't that type of man. He knew what he had to do, and he represented well. My relationship with Walton was always very enjoyable and always very cordial. Publicly, it is there for people to see, but privately, we met on occasion to chat or for coffee. And I was deeply gratified for the opportunity to chat over these issues, no matter what side of the aisle we sat on, as government or opposition. Because I knew when we sat and talked that Walton came prepared and he was going to be genuine in everything he said. And as we reflect on the volume of the man and what he committed and could contribute to Bermuda, I humbly suggest that we need to remember and live and learn from the way Walton carried himself. We did not always agree on issues. Sometimes we had some se severe disagreement. In fact, the major differences are there for people to see as well. And I did not support his approach on some of these issues at time, whether publicly or privately. But I always had the greatest respect on how he carried himself and how we could communicate. It never got personal. And in politics, as we serve, that's very important. And so as I reflect on what the man contributed publicly and privately, I will try to live from the lesson that he walked every day on how to handle himself. Walton was a man who deeply cared about Bermuda. Walton was a man who contributed greatly to Bermuda, and he had his vision of what he expected. And you have to respect that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to take this time in this honorable house to thank him for his service. As honorable colleagues have already said, and I'm sure they will say through the rest of this tribute, service in good times is hard. In the tough times that we face all too often as we serve, very difficult. It can get personal. You can search for true meaning in your beliefs. You can search for the, the support you need in your beliefs. And so all of us here can understand just how hard it is to serve. And I want to thank the honorable member for his service. I want to thank his family for allowing him to serve. All of us know that have family, how difficult it can be at times, and how, Mr. Deputy Speaker, at times your family wonder why you serve. So thank you to the mother and the family for allowing Walton to serve because he made a great contribution. And finally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, don't let today be the end of us coming together as members who were elected or appointed to serve Bermuda. Because while we will continue to have vehement differences, we all know that we come together to serve because we love our country. And that's what Walton stood for, his country. So, Mr. Speaker, it is with a heavy heart that I'm honored to give this tribute, and the man will never be forgotten by the people you serve. To the Brown family, you have our deepest prayers. And in the days that come, you know that you have a multitude of Bermudians who are ever grateful for Walton Brown, former minister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before, we'd just like to recognize uh, former MPs, um, the former deputy speaker, Walter Lister, and MP Mark Pettengill. The Deputy Speaker recognized the Honorable Minister Jamal Simmons.
Thank you, Mr. Um, Deputy Speaker. I'd like to begin by extending my condolences to his beloved mother, his brother Charles, his family, and his children. Chairman Mao once said, learn from the masses and then teach them. And Walton Brown lived by that adage because he learned from the people as much as he conveyed knowledge, wisdom, history, and understanding to them. Mr. Speaker, I had a special bond with Brother Walton because of our love of independence. I was raised to believe in independence the way many of us were raised to believe in Christianity. And so I first met him during the referendum debate on independence. And I met him at num numerous meetings where he spoke passionately. And he spoke in a manner that even if you already believed, the belief became stronger. The belief became deeper. You had the tools to be able to rationally pursue the agenda and convince others. And from there, I became even closer when I worked as VSB because he was a phenomenal political commentator who, regardless of his political beliefs and ideology, he spoke from the purely political scientist bent. Concrete analysis, factual analysis, and he was very rarely proven wrong. He predicted the 1998 election to the number when nobody else did. And people will often forget that role that he played in being very accurate in reading the people and watching the people's will be enacted. He attempted to succeed me in my former seat, Pembroke West, and I spent many time, many hours with him trying to help him to carve out a few more PLP votes in that seat. And though he was unsuccessful, he persevered and continued on. He became the host of Bermuda Speaks, and where he attempted to succeed me in Parliament, I had the good fortune to succeed him as the host when he was successfully elected in 2012. And I remember on that night, because he won by a very close margin, but I was, even though we went down in defeat, I was happy to see him achieve his dream and be able to have the opportunity to serve his country at the highest level. Together we toiled in opposition and paid the price in opposition. He was a freedom fighter while we were in opposition. He shut down the Senate. I think many remember that and something I think has never happened in our history before. And, but his passion for an immigration policy that put Bermudians first that recognized the small size of our country and tried to be sustainable and balance everything so that their people at least come out and be ended on top at the end, that was at his core. And he was prepared to fight for that. And that is something I will always respect. Minister Keynes alluded to this earlier about how yesterday we were at a function and we had an opportunity to talk. And, you know, in our careers, you often come to question, is it worth it? There are so many of us who have served who are forgotten soon after they leave or they depart this core. We speak no more of them. We don't remember their accomplishments. And we both agreed, and I know that Walton agreed as well, and he would say, it is worth it. It is worth it to see the elevation of the condition of our people. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member Rolf Commission, who will speak shortly after, he brought to our attention a quote by Walton Brown that I think is very relevant and really, to me, this, I almost hear his voice when I hear it. The British flag, God save the queen, and the governor's plumed hat are outmoded and oppressive relics in Bermuda today. I'm saddened that he never lived to see the Union Jack taken down and our own colors raised in his place. I am saddened that he did not live to see the end of the journey. But I'm comforted because I know that ideas that begin as unthinkable eventually become radical. They eventually become controversial. They eventually become understood. They eventually become politically popular. And they eventually become the law. We shall heal our wounds. We shall mourn our fallen brother. And we shall continue to fight. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The Deputy Speaker recognized the Honorable Sylvan Richards. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. 
Mr. Acting Speaker, the last few months for me personally have been difficult. I've lost more than a few friends, family, acquaintances over the last few months. People who, in my view, were cut down and taken from us in their prime, and they still had so much to offer to this country of ours. So when I found out while I was in my office that Walton had passed, I said, once again, I've lost a friend. And then I started to think, because we have friends, we have acquaintances, we have people that we see, and a lot of times we don't think, well, when did I first meet this person, or how did this person first come on my radar? So my thoughts were cast back to when I first became aware of Walton Brown, and it was at West Pembroke Primary School. And I remember him at West Pembroke. He was a year behind me, I believe. But even then, he stood out. So he's been on my radar for a long, long time. And I really got to know Walton as a man, as an adult, when we both came into Parliament at the same time, back in 2012. And that meant a lot to me. It was special to me because we started out in primary school as little kids running around on the lower field playing marbles and competing in sports, and then you find yourself sitting in Parliament at the same time serving the people of Bermuda. So that was, that was very special to me. The one thing about Walton Brown, MP, and I quickly found this out, he was very firm in his convictions. He made it very clear where he stood, and he never wavered. And he and I debated each other on occasion, and it was always, for me, entertaining. And what I liked about Walton was that, yes, he was firm in his convictions, but he had a demeanor where we could disagree without being disagreeable. That really, really stood out to me. That sometimes when we were debating, I would say something to be del deliberately provocative during the debate, and the honorable member would stop, and I'd see him take a breath, and then with a wry smile, he would respond. I respected his intellect, I respected his preparation, and I knew that if I had to be opposite Walton Brown in the debate, I had to step my game up, I had to bring my A game. I really, really respected his demeanor. I never saw him get angry. He could stand his ground, but afterwards we could go have dinner and share a glass of wine. Everybody knows that Walton enjoyed a good meal. He enjoyed to be social. I saw him out on many occasions at the various restaurants, enjoying a meal. I was always interested in who he was having a meal with, because his dinner partners were diverse. It wasn't always the same individuals. He had a little group, but I always admired the people that I saw him out with. In fact, last night, I went to a local restaurant to pick up a little something, and as soon as I walked in, the manager and another gentleman who was there immediately said, oh, it's sad about M.P. Brown. You know, Walton touched a lot of people in this community. A lot of people in this community are going to miss him. A lot of people in this community are mourning him. And what I will take away is that Once again, he was knowledgeable, but he was fair. And he could disagree with you without being disagreeable. And that's the lesson that I will take away from Walton Brown. Now, Mr. Acting Speaker, 
Some might say that it goes against the natural order of things that a mother has to bury her son. So I would give my sincere condolences to Walton Brown's mother. I knew he loved his mother. There's a picture, I think I saw it online. I don't know when it was taken, but it was M.P. Brown standing next to his mother. And I could see the pride in her face and the love in his face. And, and that's what's important in this life. Family and family supporting one another. Even if they have different stances on issues, family, that's what it's all about. So I give my condolences to his family, to his extended family, all of his friends, and I join with everybody in this house in saying that we will never meet an individual like Walton Braun again. Thank you, Mr. Actorsby. Thank you. Uh, just let me remind senators they are they can make remarks also in this house. The deputy speaker recognized the honorable member Ralph Commission. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, protocol having been established, uh, I want to once again extend uh, uh, condolences to Mother Brown, Walton's siblings, his children, and extended family. A family that has given so much to this country. Mr. Speaker, as noted before in this house, in relation to the great men and women who have passed on, the good that those men and women do is often interred with their bones. But Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you share with me the view that will not be the fate of Walton Brown, an honorable and principled man, as all here acknowledge today. His good works will live on, as have the good works and just deeds of the great men and women who preceded him. Freddie Wade, Dane Lewis Brown Evans, Julian Hall, Walter Robinson, Arnold Francis. And what of the great writers who chronicled our lives over generations in our island home? Cyril Packwood, Ira Phillips, who have passed on. Those who still live, such as young Dr. Keto Swan, and let us not forget the inestimable Dr. Eva Hutz, who had such a seminal influence on young Walton Brown. I spoke to his brother the other day, Mr. Speaker, and I said I was so shocked to hear that Walton was younger than me. <laughs> not because he looked older than me, but I, let me put this in context. I have the feeling that at age five, people who did not know Walton closely or the family would have thought he was eight or nine or 10 years old. At age 10, they probably thought he was 15 because of his temperament. I suspect he was a very precocious child. No, that will not be the fate of Mr. Walton Brown. Mr. Speaker, there were times, as some here have acknowledged, uh, I can speak to this myself, that we didn't see eye to eye on a number of issues, but when it came down to it, our differences were more about tactics and not about the goal and ultimate objective. Walton was a progressive before the name became hip. That's all you hear now in the U.S. and Western societies about the progressive movement. Walton was always progressive. Let no one have any illusions about that. 
when it came to the issues of social and economic and racial justice, and of course, independence. Walton carried on the great tradition of those giants I mentioned. He belongs in that pantheon. He will live on in our hearts for as long as Bermudians seek social and racial justice. I said that he was the pride of black Bermuda. And I say that without apology again in these chambers. He represented a generation that gladly took on that baton from his parents and grandparents and that older generation of leaders to advance that great and monumental work with courage and with conviction. Mr. Speaker, our premier cited the opening paragraph and to be honest, I was gonna do the same. He's preempted me again. Gladly, I accept that. But he's given me another opportunity. In the same preface, I'm gonna cite the final paragraph. If your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, the quote is as follows. This book is dedicated to my mother and to the memory of my father. As much as the book analyzes the collective quest for social reform, it charts the struggle they too shared and helped shape. You see, Walton Brown, like myself and many others here, was born into this movement for change in this country. We had no choice. That's the milieu that we grew up in. The role models we had were our parents and our grandparents. And people like Dr. Carmen Cafego, Roosevelt Brown, Dame Lois Brown Evans, as I mentioned. Those were our role models. That's why we're here today. And we've lost a great soldier. I spoke earlier, Mr. Speaker, about uh, when a president of the U.S. dies, you know, they have that procession. Is it down Pennsylvania Avenue? Correct me if I'm off base here. And they have that horse behind the hearse without a rider. I'm looking to my left where only two weeks ago he sat. Today we see that horse and we feel that presence without a rider. Mr. Speaker, the other day I had the opportunity of being on the show with the host, Sherry Simmons, and so I've, I spoke at length with others who were there about the greatness of this man, his, his intellectual heft, his grasp of geopolitics, and I love talking to him about geopolitics, but Walton, like many of us, could also talk about what's happening on Court Street, Middletown, Dockyard, St. George's. He was a local man with a global appreciation of this world. Let's not forget that. He asks us to always think about what is happening not only in Bermuda, but globally. And we are in debt to him. And I say that to Mr. Speaker, with respect to that, that while he kept his sights on what was happening globally, he was a man who never forgot where he came from. The Deputy Speaker recognize the Honorable Ben Smith. Good morning, Acting Speaker. Tuesday was an extremely difficult day for me. I spent the last several days reflecting on the last 15 years that I've had the honor to call Walton Brown my friend. (sighs) 
The news was devastating on Tuesday. I met Walton 15 years ago at a dinner party when I was first dating my wife. I actually met him through her. And we had the opportunity to sit and talk to each other. The conversation that I had with Walton that day at that dinner party sparked a friendship. We, we talked of every subject imaginable and just the way that he talked, the knowledge he had. meant that the following week we had another dinner party. It's been said already that Walton enjoyed going out and enjoying a good dinner, good wine, with good friends. The opportunities that I had to spend with Walton over the last 15 years, I will carry with me forever. He taught me so many things. I cherish those moments. Last Friday, we were communicating back and forth because he was away for his birthday and we were not able to get together to celebrate his birthday. But he said when he got back, we would make sure that we had that opportunity. So on Friday, we tried to organize dinner for Saturday night. And he said, can I get a rain check for next week? It's a rain check that I, I wish I could get. In the years that I have known Walt, I can tell you, we talked often about his love for his family. As a fellow mama's boy, he talks specifically about his love for his mother. As devastated as I was on Tuesday, I cannot imagine what this was like for his mother. That the way that he spoke of you, I can only imagine the love that the two of you had between each other and my condolences, sincere condolences, go to you and the entire Brown family. His son Tariq actually works for me in, in, one of my, in my business and I guarantee you I will continue to look out for Tariq specifically because Walton was my friend, my brother. And anything that you guys need, I tell you, I will be there. <sighs> Walton had a love for his PLP. We talked long into the early hours of multiple nights about the struggle that led to the PLP winning. We talked about the differences that and, and you've heard it here, respect that Walton always showed for the differences that we have. We were not always on the same page. But what I will tell you is this. When I, when I was given the opportunity to potentially become a candidate, the advice I sought was from Walton. And Walton said to me simply, you love your country, I know that for sure. Serve it. That's your responsibility. You have to serve the people of this country because together we're going to work towards making it better for all of us. It's an important piece of his legacy. He loved all of Bermuda. Not just the PLP members, but the OBA members. Not black, 
but black, white, Portuguese, all of the community. It didn't matter what your background was. It didn't matter what you believed in. Walton respected everyone. And I believe that what we should be doing going forward is living to that legacy, that we respect everyone. Our differences are what makes Bermuda strong, but we have to accept that and communicate with each other with respect because that's what Walton did. I'm gonna miss my friend. But I will always remember him. And I will live to live up to what he taught me. Thank you. The chair recognizes the honorable member, Michael Scott. Acting speaker, thank you. Uh, the reality of what we are doing here this morning, paying final, the operative word, final farewell uh, to Walton Brown weighs heavy on us, as reflected in my colleague, Mr. Smith's last tribute, as reflected in now how I know that my dear friend, uh, the Minister of Health, is feeling and has reflected how she has been gathering strength uh, to cope with the loss of our friend and colleague. With the uh, speech delivered by Ms. Leah Scott, the Honorable Member. So I want to adopt all of the tributes paid thus far uh, on behalf of Walton, hoping that what we do here this morning is supporting this noble family of Mrs. Barbara Brown and uh, Walton's boys, sons, uh, Dominique, Tariq, and, and Jared. I hope and pray that what we do here this morning is having a proper purpose. We've heard the theme of surreal, and certainly that's how I felt on Tuesday. I was in the throes of meetings at the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. I was at court. I knew that the cabinet was meeting, and it was surreal when the news came that Walton had died. And I heard the Premier, the, the Honorable David Burt, in his uh, paying of tribute, use that same word. It's been used a lot here today. Death has been heavily about us in this last fortnight. Um, I recalled as I drove uh, last Saturday on the um, front street, I saw that the flag was flying half staff and I just wondered out loud, I wonder who it was for, I didn't know. I know we had lost uh, Dr. I know we'd lost Sir James Saswin during the week. Before that, it was uh, Dr. King, Dr. James A.C. King. On Sunday when I went to church, it was announced that Trenton Butterfield, the father of Corey and Christian, had passed. And before that, uh, in my church, Kevin Bean, is a, who's a member, had lost his dear sister, Karen Green, uh, the wife of a, the chairman of my colleague, Scott Simmons, uh, branch, uh, David Green. And so the flag has flown half-staff for these noble souls. But you know, Walton carried a number of flags and raised them in his life. They were not white flags of surrender, but bright banners of a soldier of important causes for this country and the world's affairs, particularly his work on human rights, his noble work for sovereignty for this this island. So his representations both at home and abroad helped to define his work, his life, his times. Reflective, intelligent, authoritative, scholarly, vigorous in speech were all the quivers in his arsenal, which he released always with powerful effect. 
I remember Walton's voice ranging from ranging firm and convincing over my right shoulder from our opposition benches in the west corner of the house, thundering out some unstoppable case, some compelling argument on constitutional positions, on sovereignty, human rights, and justice. These were the subjects which enthralled us to Walton Brown and enthralled him to us and the world. Now land grabs in Bermuda and writing the inequities of that uh, area was a focus for Walton. It was for him both a personal matter and a cause inspired in him through his family, particularly his mother, Barbara. Land ownership is, a, is central, Mr. Acting Speaker, central to black peoples of this island's very survival. It rivals in priority and importance to even the constitutional advancement to independence. But land holding by black families in this island has come under recent attack through a number of notable agendas. They include land grabs that are unlawful and recently direct foreclosure actions fed by the onboarding by black people of this country, onboarding of debt made too easily available by lending institutions. The consequences of these agendas can and will rob ordinary citizens of this island of the scarce and important resource. And so, no wonder Walton found this question an important passion for him to promote. As I close my remarks in tribute today to a politician, a professor, a pollster, a progressive, as my colleague, Mr. Commission, has underscored, the prophet for Bermuda independence, father to Dominic, Tariq, and Jared. These roles Walton discharged in his time, Mr. Acting Speaker, with passion and excellence. These key aims we pledge as his party to both the action and deliver, and I adopt these sentiments that have been expressed uh, in, this in this house as a commitment of us all. So that one day, these seeds which have been planted, which Walton, water, which Walton watered, and they have grown now and taken root, we even see the green shoots one day, one day soon, I hope and pray. They will come to full flower as a tribute, a lasting monument to Walton Brown Jr. How interesting that Shakespeare has featured in our tributes here today. Our first speaker, the minister, uh, Levita Fogo, has shared with me this, that which I did not know, that he even took the part. Barclay often gave us uh, groundings in Shakespeare. I did Lear, Walton did Romeo and Juliet. As we seek to pay this final tribute, the words from the Prince of Denmark come to my mind. This is the imposthume of much wealth and peace that inward breaks and shows no cause without why the man dies. To Walton's mother, Mrs. Barbara Brown and the Brown family, this noble family in our midst, please accept my condolences. I pray for your continued strength throughout this time as we all have pledged this whole house from the members of the opposition, 
to the members of the government to support you in this time. Thank you. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member, Pat Gordon and Pamplin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. With protocol having been established, I wish to address the Brown family because I can say that very few things in life go according to what we hope they would. We can plan as well as we want, but there are some things that hit us at the most inopportune times that to us just make no sense. This past Tuesday, I almost lamented the fact that we have instant communication because I was able to hear a ping on my telephone to say on my WhatsApp group that there had been a tragedy within our parliamentary group. I looked, I was stunned. It's very difficult to accept that someone who, with whom we were colleagues could have been snatched away from us in such an untimely manner as what we experienced this past Tuesday. The interesting thing is I say that we are colleagues because we all come together here for the common purpose of service, irrespective of the route that we have taken to arrive at this place. We didn't share the same political philosophy, no, but we have a common aim, and that is to serve our country and our people as best we know how. Mr. Speaker, we have at times understanding that we are mere mortals. I can only empathize with his mother at this point because this doesn't make any sense. It, we don't have an explanation. We don't know why and we don't know when. But I believe that when we have the Christian hope and belief that we do, we know that we will see him again. We know that his living doesn't stop or didn't stop on Tuesday because we will always have something of Walton to carry with us and to hide in our hearts that we can use as an example when we might be tempted to fall short. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is known that the cut and thrust of the political debate can serve to bring out the worst in many of us. But Walton was perhaps that example that says, it's not necessary. We can disagree. We can be diamet diametrically opposed on fundamental principles, but we don't have to be disagreeable in the process. And that is a quality that is missing among so many of us. And I say us because I fall seriously short in that particular area. And it is a lesson that in retrospect, I will now have the ability to reflect and perhaps make a concerted effort to change even my approach. And hopefully, as we look to garner a level of respect among our colleagues in this honorable house, that we can all make a commitment to that end. Walton has shown that civility is possible, even if we are divided. After the 2017 election, Walton was appointed by the Premier to be the Minister responsible for immigration, which was the position that I held as we went into that election. So there was a continuity of responsibilities that we had, notwithstanding that I had lost my position and he had gained it. But there was, there was a fundamental issue that, was, that befell us as a country 
at that time and on which I was working. And because it was something that was going to impact our people significantly, I felt it was my, my obligation to share with Walton as the new Minister of Immigration the progress and the conversations that had been had in respect of the issue regarding passports and the BMU versus GD, B, uh, sorry, GBD nomenclature that appeared in our passports that was creating difficulty for our residents to be able to freely traverse into the United States. And I did so willingly because I felt that it wasn't about who won or who didn't win the election. It was about what issue, what information do I have on this issue that I could share to help to find a resolution to an extremely vexing problem that our people were facing. And I believe that Walton accepted the conversations that we had, he shared backwards and forwards, and we were able to at least have an understanding that there is nothing wrong with knowing information that you can pa pass on to your successor if it's meant for the better good of the country. Walton was receptive and I appreciated that. We've heard today that Walton at no time did you find him becoming personal on issues. And that's a quality that I think we can all hope to emulate. Mr. Speaker, I can say to his mom that Walton, I assumed, was one of my contemporaries. I didn't realize that I was 10 years older than he was because he had such a maturity of spirit and of attitude and of persona mm -hmm. and of knowledge and of information. He was a, a wealth of information. And it didn't occur to me that I had so many, that I was so many years his senior. However, notwithstanding that I was the old lady of the group, he never treated me in any other way other than deep and abiding respect. And for that, I will be eternally appreciative. Walton and I had the opportunity of sharing a Commonwealth Parliamentary Conference together in Nairobi, Kenya in 2010 as the Bermuda delegates. At the time, the delegation was led by Dale Butler, who was the Minister for Cabinet. Um, I was the opposition member and Walton was the government member who attended that Commonwealth Parliamentary Association conference. During those conferences, there is a segment that is dedicated to the small branches. And there was an issue at the time in which Walton had taken exception to a challenge that was being faced by one of our fellow small countries in terms of their interaction with Britain. And he didn't discuss it. We went to, walk to small countries and he said, I would like to bring forward a motion, which he did. And when I listened to the motion, which did not pass in the General Assembly, but when I listened to the motion, I thought, what do I do here? Because I didn't agree with the motion. The um, leader of the delegation, Dale Butler, said, well, because the motion's coming from somebody from our country, then maybe we should support it. And I thought, I find it very difficult to support something with which I didn't agree. So in the final analysis, when it came down to the vote, the leader of the delegation abstained from the voting. Walton, who had moved the motion, obviously voted in favor of it, and I, as his colleague, voted against it. So we ended up with three delegates all taking a different position on an issue. And we found it really quite uh, extraordinary because when the meeting was over, we all got together and we chatted and he says, well, maybe I should have explained to you beforehand what it was that I was thinking, but I was so dogmatic about the position that I thought to be correct one that I didn't give you guys that opportunity to, for us to have that discussion. And that is something that the average person may not necessarily have either recognized or appreciated. But I think that when we look at his ability to say, listen, we could have done this differently, and whether we would have gotten a different result or not is, will never be known. But 
had we had that opportunity, he recognized that this is something that we could have done and we could have done it differently. And it is those qualities that he possessed that made me understand that there is a better way to interact one with the other when we are dealing with things politic and we are dealing with things that create differences in us. So as this family is just preparing to lay to rest their loved one, very difficult, as my colleague has intimated, for a mother to bury a child. I can only wish for you comfort as you reflect on the meaning of his life, what you were able to infuse into him and to know that we are eternally grateful for what he gave to us as a people, as a country, certainly as a parliament and me personally from my family. God bless you. The acting speaker recognized the Honorable Scott Simmons. Mr. Acting Speaker, good morning. Mr. Acting Speaker, on behalf, and I'll presume to do so, uh, as it relates to my family, I recognize that my older brother is here, but I will yield to him in, in that regard. But at this particular time, I wish on behalf of our family to extend to the Brown family our deepest of condolences. Mr. Speaker, before I begin, just a few remarks on my relationship with, with, with our honorable colleague. I just wanted to say, Mr. Acting Speaker, that there are times when we, and I appreciate the words of the previous, uh, my, the previous speaker, the honorable uh, colleague in this regard, as it relates to the fact that many in our relationships here in this house, uh, from time to time, will have uh, a, a health affliction, and they continue to work in this house and serve the people of Bermuda accordingly. I don't think at times that we recognize that in a way, in a public way, but I do believe as colleagues we recognize that they do have that challenge and we do, and they do work uh, in this house and our honorable um, colleague was one of them who no matter how he felt, he continued to work very hard for this country and among his colleagues. Mr. Acting Speaker, I believe that um, there were times when I didn't agree uh, with Walton on a number of issues. We, from time to time, would have a conversation on these matters, but I can safely say that the honorable member taught me much. I believe that he traversed all sides of the House, all sides of Bermuda, and I do believe that he took the time to not understand his own, his own experience, but to also to take the time out to understand the experiences of others throughout our community. Mr. Acting Speaker, we must now support our parliamentary colleagues who were closest to him. He touched each and every one of us. His contribution to Bermuda and to the Bermuda Progressive Labor Party especially, and the body of work that he dedicated or devoted to immigration, and the plight of every Bermudian to preserve and protect our birthright as Bermudians will be greatly, greatly appreciated. He will be missed. And, Mr. Acting Speaker, I do believe that his legacy will live on and on. Thank you. The Acting Speaker recognized Senator Ms. Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Madam President, Acting Speaker, the Brown family, and all members of the legislature here assembled, present members and former members.
Charles Walton Devere Brown. I met Walton when he was a fourth year student at the Barclay Institute. And I was at the very beginning of my teaching career. So we go back a long, long way. I had the privilege of teaching Walton, albeit for a very short time, but it was during a period when his real chemistry teacher went on maternity leave. And I was in my very first year of teaching. At that time, maternity leave was something that was granted, but there were no substitute teachers. So as the second chemistry teacher, I just got double classes. So Walton, who wasn't my student per se, he ended up in my class for about a term as I had more than 40 students trying to teach them chemistry. Walton struck me immediately as a highly intelligent young man who loved to debate just about anything with a twinkle in his eye and a bit of mischievousness as well. He excelled in any subject, in any area that was of interest to him. There are other things that he didn't really enjoy and didn't really find interesting. So he kind of left them to one side until someone reminded him, you have to do well in everything in order to really show your true potential. And he did. It won't surprise any of you to hear that Walton was passionate about four subjects I'm not saying he only did four, he did a lot more than that, but four of them were his passion. English language, English literature, economics, and history. Are you getting the profile? He excelled in these subjects. He was an exceptional student. And it was around that time that career-wise, he was thinking that he would study economics at university before he went on to do a law degree. That was then. Of course, we now know that Walton went to university and the lore of political science and everything associated with it was just too great for him to ignore. That became his next passion. On his final report card from the Barclay, his economics teacher, who just happens to have been my sister, wrote, Walton is a brilliant student. I'll leave out a little bit of what she wrote. I'm sure that he will be the very successful lawyer that he desires to be. That's a quote from Sonia Grant. Then there was his English teacher. And I'll say three initials, R-K-H. And all the Barclayites in this chamber today will know to whom I'm referring. None other than the Robert Keith Horton. He wrote on Walton's final report card, it is with much sadness that the Barclay Institute and Room 3, remember, in particular, bids farewell to one of its favorite sons. Walton's intellectual gifts have developed superbly during the past two years, and he is simply destined for a magnificent future. Prince Escalus, 
may nothing thwart you as you reach resolutely for success. That's the end of the quote from Robert Keith Horton. As Minister Fogo has already said, those of us who were there at the time remember vividly Walton playing the role of Princess Galus in Barclay's production of Romeo and Juliet. This character was to be the arbiter, the peacemaker, the person who was trying to encourage the Montagues on one side and the Capulets on the other to come together to basically make love, not war. I'm sharing this information with you about Walton, the young man, so that you can appreciate that Walton was already at the age of 15, 16, on a path which led him eventually to the highest echelons of government in this country. He, he knew what he wanted to do. I suspect he knew even at West Pembroke Primary School. It was with great admiration that I watched Walton's career develop and in all that he did as a lecturer at Bermuda College, as the researcher, pollster, as a member of parliament, as a cabinet minister, he consistently upheld the highest standards of integrity, respect for the rights and opinions of others, and always acted in the best interests of Bermuda. We have lost a true Bermuda statesman, but our loss is nothing compared with what I see in the eyes, in the looks of the Brown family. You've been in my prayers ever since I heard. I know all of you. I love you and I will continue to pray for you. My deepest condolences are extended to Mrs. Barbara Brown, Walton's children, two of whom were my students at the Barclay, Tariq, Jared, and Dominic, his brother Charles, another student of mine, and Lisa, his wife, his sister, Deanna, husband, Randolph, whose children I had at Barclay as well. I think you're getting an idea of their support for the Barclay Institute. And the entire Brown clan. Walton's legacy must live on in his family and in all the debates and conversations we will have regarding the issues about which Walton was passionate. We will miss this true Bermuda champion, but we will never, ever, ever forget him. Never. Rest in peace, dear Walton. And I'm going to end by giving him the final word. This would have been the final speech that he gave as the Prince of Verona in Romeo and Juliet, more Shakespeare. Ironically, it comes right at the end of the play and you will hear some familiar words I'm going to do a little massaging of Shakespeare today. I hope I'm forgiven, but here it comes. A glooming peace this morning with it brings. The sun for sorrow will not show his head. 
for never was a story of more woe than this of Charles Walton Devere Brown. Thank you. The chair recognizes the Deputy Premier, Walter Rabon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, one thing is the tributes today, I think certainly for me, have brought a, certainly um, allowed the feelings that I may have had since Tuesday to be subsided because I've heard a lot of very um, warm and fulfilling memories of people who have been a part of our fallen colleague's life from the very beginning and have shown us a picture of him that many of us may not have known, but is fulfilling to hear at this somber time. And I am appreciative of that, which is why there's no need to go over certain even memories that I may have of uh, our dear colleague. But there's a few things I would like to say. Um, you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, amongst the field of this House, um, have been around long enough to see our party go through this a little bit too much. This is the sixth person that we have experienced who are close to us in our organization that has um, gone in the field of service. It is never easy, no matter how many times you go through this, because these are family members. They are not just parliamentarians. They are not just colleagues. They are and were family. And it's painful to lose family in this way. It is often easier that they retire from service and we know that they're going on to other duties in life and then eventually they go through the sequence of life but to leave while committed to the role of service to their country and to their party and to the citizens they have been elected to represent is difficult to witness. And so I think I express what many a PLP member is feeling right now, irrespective of where they sit in the, in the hierarchy of our party as parliamentarians or members or constituents. I think I'm expressing the pain a bit. But as I said, what I've heard this morning about our fallen colleague has brought a bit of ease. I would like to speak a bit about the man that I knew and met Mr. Deputy Speaker. Upon returning to Bermuda in the late 80s as an impressionable, slightly younger college graduate, I craved to find out what was happening in my country, get involved. And there are a few people I was directed to. And one of the people I eventually found my way to was the doorstep of Walton Brown and it was an automatic um, spark for me because I was a political science graduate particularly international politics and I found somebody in Bermuda for the first time that I could have discussions with and fulfill my own interests with and Walton was that person at that time of my life. And visiting his home, sat in his study, and if anybody remembers that study, it was a table, he had books all around. It, was, it looked like a professor's study. So you knew this it was a learned man. And we talked about all things, Marxism, Leninism, all the theoretical, and it was, and it was a wonderful experience. And of course, with that came the issue of sovereignty, which was his passion. Um, and of course, Bermuda in general. And I, of course, joined the committee that he chaired to push for Bermuda's full sovereignty. 
and um, it was a great learning experience for me at that time. Um, I then and today am committed to Bermuda fulfilling full sovereignty and if anything being with Walton and all the other members who were there helped to shape and solidify my commitment to that vision for our country that clearly Walton Brown at that period of Bermuda's time helped to shape and much of what we understand and what we believe around that issue is shaped by the words of Walton Brown and he certainly articulated as is already said his brilliant mind and ability not only brilliant but ability to articulate clearly the message around the issue that he was very strongly um, committed to was a gift and made him the natural spokesperson for the group and as has already been said despite his solidity in his commitment to many of his causes, he had a broad church of people that he um, would gather with and talk to, even if you didn't agree with him. He was very clear and very measured in how he argued. Often we find people who are staunch activists, of which Walton was, that the people on the other side may find you toxic to deal with because you're so strong and often maybe you're very emotional and passionate around and that may turn off some of your opponents but Walton was never like that it seems as almost sometimes his opponents would be drawn to him the anti-independence people would engage him all the time because Walton could engage in a way that was measured and thoughtful and articulate and clearly solid but he didn't do things in a way that um, suggested he was disrespecting his opponent. Very true. He didn't suffer fools or ignorance gladly and made it very clear. And I can remember some of the points he would um, make, particularly around discussions about independence, where somebody said to him after perhaps a long going back and forth, then the person would say, well, we need to be concerned that Spain may, may itself exercise its right to take back Bermuda because it was the first uh, um, country to land here. And he said, <laughs> you know, he just shake his head and say, so that's where the argument went. But clearly he felt, well, that's where the person had to go because all the other arguments that they had tried to put to me just didn't work. But he would lead even those discussions. You know, that person might come back again and try and have another conversation with him. But that's how Walton was. And speaking to him as a person who from a social standpoint clearly it's been articulated by many who knew him that he was social and it's true um, his house where he lives now and where he lives and uh, where i certainly knew him was always a gathering place for people when he had p um, parties there was a cross section of people some people you'd be surprised were there but they were at Walton's house, and he led a very vibrant social environment when he had parties, when he had events at his home. And you felt like even with the opponents on the other side of the room, you were all there for the same thing, to have a good time, in respect of your views, because that's the type of environment Walton could cultivate around himself. And so I was all drawn to that and enjoyed um, the back and forth around the politics, the social, and the man. And I learned a great deal from him. He was clearly gifted in the areas of politics in most areas. He was perhaps the best pollster that operated in Bermuda during his time when he was actively involved with it. And that's been articulated by others here about how well he came to the results many times um, with research innovations. And most of all, Walton was committed to the country. He was committed to his family. He was committed to seeing what he believed was right for Bermuda to be achieved. And that could be seen in the causes that he steadfastly, consistently stayed with, certainly for the almost 30 years that I knew him. They never changed. 
sovereignty, human rights, LGBT rights, for Bermuda to have its rightful place in, in, in the international environment. And even though we are a colony, he even desired to make sure that the relationships that Bermuda would develop, even in this limited state, were suitable for Bermuda to move forward with the UN, with the Caribbean, and with other countries. Walton did that and was given the responsibility for doing that at different times under different premiums. So that is a testament to the consistency in the commitment to certainly around the issue of land rights. He took that up and carried it, and certainly his articulation around the issue of land rights is what motivated very much what we all believe today is important in that area, is because Walton took it up, articulated what should be done, brought it straight to the legislature, and that is a part of the agenda, the unfinished work that he has presented to us. Human rights continues to be an issue, and other rights, Walton was uncompromising in his belief on what should be done and pushed us, often having some of us in the own party not on his side, but stayed committed to what he felt was right, always consistent in every way, with every cause that he put his name to, and never communicating in a way to others, even his opponents, to be offensive, to be derogatory. He was clear and intelligent and decisive in his message on all the things that he believed in. Walton was a Pembroke man, through and through. I'd never known him to not be living in Pembroke. He was raised, he studied clearly, and he represented Pembroke. And of all of us who are left who are the Pembroke members of Parliament, I think he is the one who is continuous in that experience. He was, he's remained in Pembroke, ran in two different constituencies in Pembroke, one of which he was victorious, but I never went to a house that he lived in that wasn't in Pembroke. So he's truly a Pembroke man, committed to his parish, committed to his people, and committed to his country. And as he would share his experience with you, it was clear that the history of his family bared great influence on his path in life, talking about his grandfather and the experience that his grandfather had here in Bermuda and abroad, and his commitment to Bermuda moving forward, shaped Walton in what he did and what he believed in and how he moved forward. So if you truly got to know him, you understood the man, what he was about, what he believed in, and the purpose he felt for himself, and why he was committed to serving his country. I feel honored and blessed that I had the opportunity to know him for as long as I have, to have been influenced and learned from him in the way that I have, and that our party had that benefit as well, and his constituents in Consistency 17. I would now like to express my sincere condolences to his family, to his mother, to his brother, to his sister, and all of the Brown family. Bermuda has lost a great son, and so have they. And certainly, as a member of the PLP, as a Bermudian, I would do my best to see that the causes that Walton felt so strongly about are fulfilled in their appropriate manner. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The acting speaker recognized the honorable member, Lawrence Scott. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. And with protocol having been established, Mr. Acting Speaker, I may not be the vintage to be able, as some members in this chamber with their seniority and being seasoned. Um, but as one of the younger members in this chamber and 
the fact that I may not have gone to the Barclay Institute, there may be some ministers that says that means that I can count. Others would say that I can still boast of having been a classmate of Walton Braun in the class of 2012, the elected class of 2012. And one thing that stands out is that soon after being elected, it was myself, Walton Braun, and Minister Wilson, who would spend a lot of time outside of Parliament together. And Walton would culture me on quite a few things and aspects in life. And although there are members that can say that he was wise beyond his years, for me as a younger member of not just parliament but of society, his age was timeless because I still felt as though I could relate to him. I didn't feel as though he ever talked down to me but counseled me. And the thing that stands out about well, one of the many things that stands out to me was he always believed in people's nobler nature. So it wasn't about the action that they might have done or the position that they were taking at that time. It was who they could become, where they could go, what they could achieve. And that goes as far as to the wider community and the country as a whole. And his belief, and my understanding of his belief in Bermuda as a country being, and our nobler nature, to be able to do things on our own, to be able to be an independent country. There was no need for us to be tied to anyone or anything else. And one thing that, and I'll, I'll share a story that many in here will already know that the budget debate of 2013 where Walton was very policy and procedure driven where if you don't have enough members in the chamber any member of the house can call for a quorum <laughs> and for those that are listening that might not be familiar with parliamentary procedure, the budget debate is that of the opposition's. It's the opposition's duty to carry that debate. And right after lunch, with the first debate, budget debate of our opposition, the Honorable Walton Braun looked around and said that there are not enough members in this chamber to carry the debate and asked the speaker, Speaker Horton, who's in the chamber now, to call a quorum. And the whip at the time, the Honorable Levita Fogo, had to do her duty <laughs> and round everybody up to show that they were in the house and that we did have enough to continue. And the, thing, the moral of the story there is that Walton saw how important this duty of service is. He ensured that the policy was followed at all means and all costs. And even though that meant holding his own team members to account. And that is something that speaks to his integrity and his honor and his character. And one thing that Walton was, was reliable and consistent. And for me, as the current bit, and with our caucus meetings, Acting Speaker, you know you're one of those that show up on time, if not early, every time. Every time without fail, Walton was there early, if not on time. And what that allows for is that 
I believe is part of the foundation on what we've seen today. Members on both sides being able to speak to and remember how pivotal of a role he played. Then I think the best way for me to express that is by, and it's not, I'm not going to sing it. But <laughs> I'm not going to sing it, but um, just the first verse of Simon and Garfunkel's song, A Bridge Over Troubled Waters. When you are weary and feeling small, when your tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. Oh, I am on your side. Oh, when times get rough and when friends just can't be found, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. Like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. That, to me, captures one of the major roles that the Honorable Walton Brown provided, not just for this parliament, but for the country, because when it comes to the controversial issues, immigration, same-sex marriage, behind the scenes, and the colloquial would be that back channel, that bridge over the troubled waters which plagued our island at the time was Walton Brown. He was the one that would reach out on the other side and say, hey, here's where we, although we are divided in these aspects, this is where we are of like mind. Why don't we build on that? And so for me, I think that losing that pillar of our community, losing that reinforcement in the bridges that connect us, it is not just sobering, not just humbling, but it's gratifying in the sense that it allows us to be grateful for the time that we've spent with him, the laughs that we've had, and the memories that we share. And as I take my seat, the last quote that I would like to use to encapsulate and capture MP Brown's essence is by a, just one line out of a poem that is near and dear to my heart and other members in this chamber's heart, is a line from the poem If by Ruyard Kipling. And the one line that I wanna focus on is, if you can walk with kings and not lose the common touch. That, 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 was, that was him. He was a member of the cabinet. He was a member of the Senate. He was a member of the House of Assembly. But yet, he never lost the common touch. So if you can walk with kings and not lose the common touch. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognized the honorable member, Kim Swan. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Mr. Acting Speaker, on, on this sad occasion, on behalf of my PLP branch and constituency number two, my wife Cindy and my family, I offer my sincere condolences to the family of our dearly departed colleague, Walton Brown, Jr.
To the family gathered here today, my heart goes out to you especially as you know most intimately the life of Walton Brown Jr. as a family member. Mr. Acting Speaker, the spirit of Walton Brown was captured in this very room today as it was the first time in my time in Parliament that we did not turn to the East in prayer. A position Walton Brown observed in every session he attended in Parliament. In recalling the life of Walton Braun from my lands, the most poignant memory I have was a photo that was captured of a very young Walton Braun with his family at a historic protest in the 60s. Proverbs 22.6 states, Train up a child in the way they should go, and when he is ill, he will not depart from it. In the lead up to the 1995 independence referendum, I found myself on the same side of this important issue as Walton Brown Jr. Walton Brown was the spokesman for the Committee on Independence and those of us who supported independence from the UBP were definitely a minority there, I will say. We respected the position advanced by Walton Brown, Jr. I remember proudly voting for independence on that day and standing at the polling station in St. George with my friend Phil Parentship in 1995. That's 24 years ago. And there was a division amongst those of us who supported independence at the time. And during this period in 1995, Walton Braun Jr. was a peacemaker attempting to bridge the divide that emerged between those who were supporters of independence. Today, as we mourn the passing of Walton Braun Jr., independence for Bermuda remains long overdue. And I thank Walton Braun Jr. for the great work he has done to advance the great importance of independence to Bermuda fulfilling her true potential. Walton and I both have been talk show hosts at Hot 107.5 Inter-Island Communications, and I know I speak on behalf of Inter-Island Communications in extending uh, heartfelt condolences uh, to the family and friends of Walton Braun. We shared that Sunday evening slot, and I remember when he interviewed me as opposition leader, a political adversary. He said, we're just going to have a conversation. And we had a conversation, and he could make his points very succinctly without a lot of rancor. Um, quite different from myself who's trying to take a page today out of his book. He'd be a lot more quiet spoken. <laughs> Imitation is the greatest form of flattery, they tell me. Later years, more recent, I was able to interview him as a minister and a political colleague. It meant a lot to me to have him there in studio. The work of Walton Braun Jr. is reflected in his book, Bermuda and the Struggle for Reform, Race and Ideology, 1944 to 1998, was also used by the Joint Select Committee examining the events of December 2nd, 2016, of which I was chairman. And we used his book to put in context immigration and the immigration policies that evolved in, in Bermuda, so significant was his, his, his works. And I would commend persons to read his works. In closing, I offer my condolences to his, to his mother, his sons, siblings, family, and, and friends. 
I'd say Walton Brown was the conscience of the Progressive Labour Party. As diverse as we are, we have founding members and who many who have passed on who held great principles near and dear to our heart. And if anyone would look at Al Frederick Wade, the late William Lewis Ron Evans, Gene, C. Eugene Cox, and others who have passed on and see the issues that he held near and dear to his heart and advanced just the big, just the big three. He was in line with, with them. I think it's important uh, to, make, to make note. May God comfort his entire family and friends during this difficult time. And may Walter Braun rest in peace. The acting speaker recognized Honorable Neville Terrell. Thank you for recognizing me. Madam President, Mr. Acting Speaker, members of, the, of Parliament, both former and present, members of the Braun family, extended otherwise, and friends. Uh, I wish to express the heartfelt condolences of myself and the entire Tiro family for your loss. Mrs. Brown and family, we will keep you in our prayers during this difficult time. It's, it's, it's been a loss to me of a, a, a friend and colleague, and I, I say colleague because um, in the class of 2017, he was in my class. So I, I feel proud about that. Um, Walton's uh, passing was certainly a shock uh, to us all, and it will be difficult to replace this brilliant son of the soil. Now, uh, Walton was sort of a person that, you know, didn't suffer things gladly, and one of them was repetition. And a lot of it has already been said today. But there are a couple of um, small things that I would like to share, share with you uh, that certainly uh, brought Walton and I uh, together. Um, during his period of uh, minister, Walton actually sat directly in front of me. I was a back band, I'm in the back bench, and he was on the front bench. So we had the opportunity, uh, several opportunities, to chat um, while the debate was uh, going on. And I, I certainly uh, picked up a lot from him. But I, I certainly remember one time when we were, uh, as caucus, prepping for the debate on the now, one of Bill, uh, the up to seven grams. And I, I told him that I felt a little conflicted in, 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 in speaking because I had always preached to my children and my grandchildren about the smoking of marijuana because it was illegal. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't legal. So I, 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 I felt conflicted. But I understood the, the, the bill, what it was intended to do, and it was to protect our young people from getting a racket that would stay on there for, the, you know, for, you know, for their life and cause them not to be able to either leave the island or further their education. And when I, when I, when I discussed that with him, uh, he, he said to me, I remember him saying to me, you believe what you say to your, your, your children, what you have said to them and your, and your grandchildren. And, and I said, yes. <laughs> he says, well, look, speak your conscience, be principled about it, and just say it. And it, it gave me the spirit to, to speak on that bill that day, and I'm glad I did. And, and as I said, it was certainly as a, as a result of, of, of Walton. Um, it was mentioned earlier, uh, without giving any secrets of, of, of caucus, that Walton was always early at, at caucus, and so was I. And Mr. <laughs> Acting Speaker, you were one of the four as well that was, you know, usually, usually early. And one of the rules that the whip had, or has and still has, is that the last person in the room before starting at 5.30 has to say the prayer. Well, we all know Walton's position on that. And I always said to him, I see why you come early but I'm waiting for the day when you come late 
And he gave me a smile and just says, yeah, you wait. <laughs> um, I, I always found um, Walton and I's brief exchanges uh, very, very enlightening. Um, it, it, I found him so knowledgeable. In fact, it was also uh, mentioned. I thought Walton was older than me. I really did. <laughs> because he was so schooled in, 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 in everything. Just, you can put your glasses back on. It was so stupid. <laughs> Uh, because he was just so knowledgeable and he, he taught me some things, certainly on, on human rights and sovereignty. That was his two main subjects that, he, that he, would, he would talk to me about. And as I said, I learned quite a lot uh, from him. Um, I'm certainly uh, going to miss him. Uh, I was just, I came about a, a, a quote uh, very, very, very recently, which I think, in my opinion, described describes uh, Walton, and I'd, I'd like very much just to repeat. It's a short one. It's from, uh, those of you may know him as Stokely Carmichael. Some know him as Kwame Ture. And it says, there is a higher law than the law of government. That's the law of conscience. And that's something that, you know, Walton always, always expressed. You know, speak your conscience, be loyal, <laughs> to your position. And as I said, uh, I, I will miss him. I will miss his presence. Uh, in this uh, setting here, he sat two seats down from me. As you can see, well, it was empty until my colleague just sat in it. Uh, but, you know, he will be missed. And um, I hope his legacy uh, lives on. And I say to my friend and colleague, Rest in peace. Thank you. The acting speaker recognizes the honorable member, Tanae Ferbert. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. I start off with uh, condolences to the Brown family and Walton's friends and the constituents of C-14. Sorry, 17. I have a uh, connection uh, with the Brown family. My godmother um, is Walton's cousin. And growing up as a young girl, she used to take us to all the <laughs> Brown functions. So I'm very familiar with the Brown homestead. And also visiting uh, Walton's home when he used to have functions at his home. And I just remember how close-knit the family was and, and still are. And so I know this Walton's uh, leaving us is a great, great, great loss. So my greatest condolences to the family, and I, I hope that this pulls you even stronger together. When I heard of um, the death of Walton, I was actually uh, um, in the office and I was actually going through my phone and I was showing uh, one of my colleagues some pictures of a recent trip that I had been on and we were talking about experiences and memories and how important experience and memories are so that we can fall back on them for those um, memories in making us uh, remember when we felt good and how we can um, be joyous about certain experience and memories that we've we've been through and then i ran down to the cabinet bu building to be with my colleagues and then i i suddenly remember that my daughter had a netball game and I, I i i said i needed to be there because knowing walton and walton's family family is very important and so i left to go uh be with my daughter at her uh, Napo game. She appreciated that. There's something uh, that I do remember um, in regards to Walton. There is a quote that I would like to share. And it says, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. And we and 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 knowing Walton and his convictions, and him being himself, 
that definitely was a great accomplishment. I lift my face up and his face is staring right at me. But Wotan was very deliberate on his feelings, um, particularly what I remember is his feelings and how he felt about us giving allegiance to the queen. And every time when we, it would come for us to read the oath, I would look up to see what it is that Walton would do. Because we knew deep down inside where our allegiances should lie. And that is something that I do uh, remember about Walton, his commitment to our island, uh, pushing forward with independence, his commitment for our island, pushing forward uh, with land grabs, and comprehensive immigration reform. There was also that he, something that he felt very strongly about, and that was how we report um, on our, how we report in our community about our public school system versus the private school system. I remember Walton as being a professor and how knowledgeable he was. I, I used to often listen intensely to him when he did speak because he made such sense. And he could speak off of topics from the top of his head. And you're like, Walter, where are you storing all that information? But he's a great speaker and he will definitely be missed. And I just want um, us to remember that, I mean, me particularly, I serve a living God. And living, I say that because I feel as though uh, he is always with me. And I know that Walton will continue to be with us. And we will remember him with the things that we do. And we'll remember his presence in this house. So we should not let his ideas, his thoughts, his research, his literature fall on deaf ears. So I urge our community, like uh, another member has said, to go and buy his books. Go and study his literature. Talk to your elders. Talk to those who came before us. There is a quote that's there is a quote that I or something that reminds me of Walton because he said this all this time. And it is, if you don't know your past, or something to this tune, if you don't know your past, how can you deliberate and properly plan your future? And I think that's very important for us because at times we make decisions without having the research and knowledge behind it. And that is something that I uh, definitely will take away as a memory uh, from Walton. Thank you, Mr. Um, Acting Deputy. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The, the Acting Speaker recognized the Honorable Renee May. Good afternoon, Mr. Acting Speaker and listening audience. I first of all would like to um, let the um, Brown family know that they are truly in my thoughts and prayers. And I also bring condolences on behalf of my branch, which would be constituency number one. I'm gonna start this because it would be seen like it's so informal, the way I'm talking to you right now, because family, a group of people who are related to each other. Now, some maybe 24 years ago, um, Barbara's nephew decided he was gonna marry this girl from St. George's, named Renee Anderson at the time. Um, and so I have been in the Ming family for over 24 years because I think I dated Ro for five years before marrying him. And so one of the things that always stands out when it comes to family is they have a very strong family tie. But if you want to stay in good standing with your family, you must go to the family annual family picnic every year. I don't care what you hear of, by the fact that you're in the hospital or something like that, or off island, you better find your way down Clearwater Beach. And it used to be the Sunday after cup match, but now it's the Sunday before cup match. And so it's at that time that would have been my first encounter um, with Walton and his family. 
Um, Barbara was actually one of the first people that she met me to give me like the biggest hug and welcome me into the um, family, even though at that time I was still uh, outside of the family in terms of marriage. So the ties um, to the Ming slash Braun family go back years. It's amazing that when you look back on things and you reflect um, and haven't been around them in a lot. Walton is very um, common in his family, his, his mannerisms, because the men in the family are generally cool, calm, and collective. I have never seen my father-in-law upset. I've seen him be passionate about things and speaking, but never be upset. And so the men in the family are cool, calm, and collective. My sister, my um, I see Deanna over there looking at me, shaking her hair. That's because the women are the complete opposite. <laughs> and um, they can let you know exactly what they're thinking and where you can get off. And so if you've been around enough, you can appreciate that. And even over the last week, I've had a few laughs at um, some of the things. Even though, through the sadness, you try your best to find um, things to make you smile and um at least be happy about and one thing is that we know that we are not mourning at this time we are celebrating the life of a person who was amazing and it's funny because in you as a um, as a member of parliament you prepare for everything right so you think about what you're gonna wear what you're gonna say and this morning i remember thinking let me get out the traditional black dress and then I thought about it, I said, well, Walton was really not a black dress person. He was as colorful as you could get. So what you see today is representative of how I felt he was. And he was colorful. I did feel awkward when I walked in the room at first. I'm like, all oh, my colleagues are calling these dark colors. But if you know the person that he is, he was extremely colorful. So my family side of Walton probably started in the early 90s but my real conversations with Walton started in 2012. And that was when I became actively involved in um, big politics. And I remember him saying to me, I didn't know you was interested in politics. And then from there, the conversation goes on. Probably a good thing I was a member of the Progressive Labour Party because I wonder how those conversations would have been if I was big politics on the other side. And maybe he would not have shared so much, but he wasn't that person anyhow. He would have embraced me any which way, but I'm just saying that it made it a lot easier, I'm sure. Ben smiling at me, said. So. Um, I remember in the Senate, when I was a senator, and we used to have a lot of conversations back then because I didn't know um, some things, and, and history is very important during the legislative process. And he would at times say that yeah, you could think about this, or I could refer to this, or I should read this, and whatever. But one time where I really had to call him was the Papacorn ceremony in 2000, and I think it was 13. And of course, it's, the popcorn ceremony is out in St. George's. This, it is a big thing for St. George's. And the, my colleagues know I email out like, who's coming to the popcorn ceremony to make sure that like, they are in St. George's. But when the God Save the Queen song came, when it wrote and didn't stand up, I almost died. I was like, what are you doing getting St. George's? Like, you have to act proper. You know, this is, this is the Queen's event. So he said to me, call me later and I'll tell you about it because I was fit to be tired. Like, I was WhatsApping him, like, you gotta stand up. Like, you gotta stand up. And I was telling everybody else, hit him because he's gotta stand up, right? Um, so our conversation about two days later after that, it was about two hours where he explained his position to me. And so I wish somebody had told me prior to the popcorn ceremony because I was having about five heart attacks, I swear, as I was having it, you know, like, he's got to get up, telling people, hit him. Um, but I came to respect that position and understand the why behind it. And then that conversation actually led us into greater conversations on um, independence and immigration. And um, during my time in the Senate, there were some controversial immigration bills that came. And sometimes having that discussion with Walton on, you know, helped me understand um, either sometimes the position that our party has taken or positions from our people or the historic nature of why immigration was so emotive and remains so emotive even in our country. So um, 
it's it's amazing how you reflect on things as time and time is just one of those things where we don't we think we've got so much so much of it and we just never you know, we just never ever knew one thing the Walton always told me he was going to come on my saturday walks and for those of you that don't know i do a walk every saturday morning and he was always coming him and a few others but i wouldn't name him here today mr deputy speaker <laughs> so i guess he will not make it on that walk now <laughs> And that's something I guess I'll have to take up with him at another time um, because he's, I used to tell him that I'm going to teach you some things about St. George's. And he'll say, I'm coming in, people, at 7 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if I could make that. So maybe we shouldn't put off those things we think because he used to say, I will come. But I, didn't, I never got a date, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I do want to say one thing, though, that um, our colleague was definitely an avid listener because you could be on a rant and complaining about something and Walton would always listen. And he would say, uh-huh, and give you the shake of, uh-huh, and let you get out what it is that you need to say. And then he might just sometimes give you a very completely different perspective on something. I know in the house the last time we said there was a bill that we were debating, um, we had, and I remember bouncing something off of him and then I will go back with another question. And I do recall he one thing he did say to me many years ago, he was always he always said that you should trust your God. Mm. And that is something that I've never forgotten and probably um am very true to because my um, colleagues and those persons who sat on committees and stuff, I will ask a million questions to ensure that I'm making the right decision. That's, and, and always for things that are in the best interest of Bermuda and her people. Reading the newspaper, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday and um, hearing the update with regards to the land grabs is something else that was um, near and dear to Walton's heart. And I knew that the Ming family will be happy to see that that continues to progress. And I hope that the legacy of Walton lives through that inquiry because there is much information, I'm sure, that will be released and garnered and things that um, the public just need to know. And so I'm hopeful that his legacy continues with that land grab and I'm hopeful that the Ming family get some of the answers that they too, for many, many years, have looked for. Mr. Deputy Speaker, life is about relationships. And even in our political realm, we create, we build, we develop relationships. And I think that my other colleagues have hit the nail on the head when they said Walton was just one of those people who had relationships on this side and this side. And it's probably something that we could all learn um, from him, you know, going forward in our behaviors and um, how we speak to one another and how we just address our, people, our colleagues who, in the grand scheme of things, are just like us. I don't think anybody bleeds any different in this room. We have a different, we, we have a same common ground of where we wanna to get to. Sometimes it's just how we get there. And so um, if our takeaway could be from our colleague, it would be to um, remember that as we move through and we navigate this political world. Because one day I won't sit here, I may sit somewhere else, and um, I would hope that whatever the legacy I leave behind is one that others would want to follow. So in closing, Mr. Acting Speaker, my question, and it would be for my colleagues, would be, so what now? What will we do to continue Walton's legacy? And with those comments, I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. The acting speaker recognizes the Honorable Minister Wayne Furbert. Good afternoon, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I stand here this afternoon, first of all, let me give condolences to 
the Brana family, in particular his mother, and to his good friend, the Honorable Kim Wilson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, to be honest, I, I wasn't going to speak. I find it hard to stand this morning or this afternoon to, to bring tribute to a person I call a friend. Don't know about Walter Brown. It's just been over two years since I lost another good friend, the Honorable Sean Crockle. At that time, I remember going home and sitting on my wall and singing the song, Going Too Soon. Tuesday, when we heard about the worst of Walton, I had to stand strong for my friend, T. Wilson. But I tell you, when I went home, I cried like a baby. It was late that night when I sat in my bed and I said, if I did it for Sean, I'm going to do it for Walt. And we put the words and I'll repeat them. As I lay me down, heaven hear me now. I am lost without a cause after giving it my all. Winter storms have come and darkened my sun. After all I've been through, who on earth can I turn to? And the words goes on to say, I look to you, I look to you. After all my strength is gone, I look to you. His death has set in us all. It was unexpected. You see, on Friday night, Kim and I, with Walton, was together. We were a team that hung out, hoping the cabinet came out early, which was unusual. But when Walton was in cabinet, Kim and Walton called me. When I went to cabinet, Kim Walton and I called Walton. So every Tuesday we hung out. And a lot of Fridays we snuck out of the house. Yeah, that's true. Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Walton was a good economist. And despite Kim being a lawyer, she also. Because Mr. Deputy Speaker, they drink wine. And they drink wine. And they drink wine. I drink Perrier with Rose's Lime. And then they divided the bill by three. That's what made them good economists. And so the person that lost out was me. And that's it. Mr. Speaker, we were supposed to go away Friday, last Friday, to New York. Three of us, plus our spouse, and who have a water someone to bring. But we didn't go. It was all planned. We were supposed to go to see Temptation Friday night. Sadly, we were supposed to go see a play and eat at a steakhouse, because Walton wanted to go to the steak place in New York. But my wife couldn't make it so up. I wasn't good about myself to make the council. Mr. Speaker, Walter was an amazing individual. He was a deep thinker. He had amazing intellect. He could debate an issue, and as people have said, and not get angry with anybody. He had to teach me a few things. Because normally, most of us stand up and interpolate. I didn't see Walter interpolate many times. He just sat there calm and peaceful. He was a great poster. He was such a great poster. 
Jamari with me remember the reason why I was kicked out of another place because they believe bolts and spells. <laughs> Read my book, I'll tell you, finish that one off. <laughs> I'm revealing something today, but I'll... <laughs> that was that was Grant Gibbons. I said, Grant, I don't understand that all these years you believe there's posters in New York, but you know if you believe in Walton's pearls. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I still have the print on Friday night. And came up there said to me, when are we going lunch? I brought Chish Michael, the same thing Walton just say. When are we going? This is what Wal Walter writes on Friday. What time are we meeting? Today, Kim writes, where? Walter writes, lobster pot. Kim writes, okay, what time? Walter writes, 12.30. I stuck my thumb up saying, I'll see you. I was too busy, <laughs> Kevin, to the work. Kim writes, on my way walking. Walter writes, okay. I walked in late. And as usual, I went around shaking everybody's hand in the restaurant. Walter will get angry at me and say some other things which I can't say in this honorable house today. But the first word started with an M. We stayed together for about five hours that day. Five hours. Kim had to go to City Hall. I'd look at some artwork. And I went along with Kim, and we came outside, and my last hug of Walter. Because we hug each other every time we laugh, every time after dinner, every time after lunch. We hug. So it was a shock to us. So, Mr. Speaker, if you allow me to say this, how can we say thanks for the things that Walton's done for us? Things so undeserved, yet he gave to prove his love to us. The voices of a million angels cannot express our gratitude. All that we are and ever hope to be, we partly owe it all to Walton. My salute to you, brother. May God bless you and his family. Mr. Premier. The acting speaker recognizes the Honorable Senator Crystal Caesar. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Thank you for indulging me. First, I'd like to just say my heartfelt condolences to the Brown family. Legislative colleagues, former and current <clears throat> friends and family. I debated whether I was going to follow such a heartfelt tribute to my colleague, but in his honor, I feel it would be remiss if I did not. He had a profound impact on my life, and I thought that I should share. <clears throat> Henry David Thoreau in 1849 uh, wrote an essay with regard to civil disobedience. That essay spoke to the need to prioritize one's conscience over the dictates of laws. 
and around that ethos is how Walton and I became such good friends and I actually consider him a mentor. And why I say that was because in, I wanna say late February, early March, 2016, I was sitting in my office doing work, listening to a particular popular show in which Walton was the guest. And he um, sent out an appeal to the public in general with regard to some legislation that was going to be tabled, which he actually found quite alarming. And I had known of Walton back from my college days and from serving on a couple of boards with him. And so I had a lot of time for him and a lot of respect. But this particular day, what he spoke about was actually, um, for whatever reason, I still don't know, um, it appealed to me. And this was around the legislation that was called Pathways to Status. As we all know, Walton was a very learned man on issues of sovereignty. And when I heard him speak, something in me became um, alarmed, but also it ignited something in myself. So he called, sent out the call to attend a meeting at the Young Men's Social Club. And um, I did so along with two of my colleagues. And we listened to him and what that legislation could possibly mean for the country. And I must say that it was alarming to say the least. And through that meeting, I developed a connection with Walton that has actually brought me here to stand as a senator today. <clears throat> After that meeting, he and two of my colleagues, we put our heads together as to what could we do to heed the call of expressing our civil disobedience. Some of you may not know, but um, he, myself, and the two others uh, came up with the ideas for some of the protests at some of uh, the public meetings that had been held. In addition, I was one of those, I'm not a morning person, but he convinced me to get up early one weekday morning and stand, stand down on East Broadway and interrupt traffic to make the island understand and note what this legislation could possibly mean for the country. I can't say that I was ever um, one who was that learned or even that into issues of, of social justice. But again, he awakened something in me that still to this day is, is a light. And from those protests, one may recall the group IREG, the Immigration Reform Action Group being formed in which many young people people even younger than myself, um, became very um, knowledgeable on issues of immigration that would affect Bermuda. Through that collaboration, I can proudly say that along with Walton, we were able to have that particular piece of legislation pulled. It was withdrawn. During that time, I developed a fondness, um, admiration, and appreciation for Walton because I can be deemed somewhat of a spitfire 
and he was very calming, very um, astute. So he, he would let me have my say, and then he'd say, okay, Crystal, now think about it this way. And I appreciated that. When I heard the news on Tuesday, I was overcome <clears throat> with emotion because I felt as though a deep relationship that had just begun would no longer be. <clears throat> but God knows all, and he knows why he brought us together that two years ago, almost three years ago now. and why he would allow Walton to come into my life and the lives of those close to me. So much so that we, the four of us, the other two ladies that I speak of, we sort of called ourselves the undercover Panthers <laughs> because we all did things um, silently, but in a very revolutionary manner. And so I felt I had to speak on the relationship that we developed and the impact that he had on my life. And I have to thank his family for sharing him with us. I appreciate it. And I can only hope that I will continue the work that Walton has begun and continue to carry and shine that light that fire that he lit in me. Thank you. Just before we have the final speaker, the premier, I just want to just pass a note from Cole Simons, who's overseas. He wants me to read this. He says, please pass on my regrets to the House on the passing of the honorable member, Mr. Walton Brown. The House has lost a member of high intelligence, a member committed to the development of Bermuda's young people, and a member who was passionate about Bermuda's constitutional reform and human rights. He was a gentleman and respected other people's views and perspectives, even if he did not agree with them. It was indeed a pleasure to work with him as a fellow member of Parliament, and he will be sadly miss. Mr. Premier. Oh, Madam AG, you just got to let us know now. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker. Mr. Acting Speaker, I think it would be remiss of me not to rise today and give credit where credit is due. So I'd like to take this time on behalf of all honorable members and women to honor Mrs. Brown. There will be no Walton without his mother. She, in my mind, is the most singular, important person who should be honored today. As a mother of three young men, I honestly believe that in our children's eyes, we actually are God. We are the providers, we are the protectors, and we are the bearers of life. So Mrs. Brown, I hope to never walk in your shoes too early. I'd also like to thank the OBA for bringing their pathways to status legislation, because it was through that exercise that I'm standing here today and the gentle giant that you've all portrayed is unknown to me because in debating that legislation in a private conversation with Walton, he shouted at me and insulted me and called me 
a backseat protester. I didn't sleep that night. And I was actually a consultant on at the cabinet office. And I went to work the next morning and corralled the staff and we marched up at the house. And from that moment, I was branded a troublemaker. But I'm happy to stand in this chamber and be a troublemaker because what we're chosen to do, what I've been called to do by the man sitting in the front row is to engage in a very particular and special type of service. And my challenge to my colleagues today is to consider the portrait of the man that you've painted today quite eloquently. But not just to continue to speak, but to actually do. Because oftentimes we find ourselves commemorating our colleagues, only to return the next session to continue business as usual. So to colleagues who have stood today and made quite heartfelt speeches about what I would characterize as the way forward in terms of our preparation, our narrative, our respect for each other, I encourage you to put your money where your mouth is and to serve in a way that can be commendable and not just say but you do. Thank you. Final speaker, Mr. Premier. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Mr. Acting Speaker. Uh, Mr. Acting Speaker, there has been a lot that has been said uh, today in honor of someone who we will all dearly miss. The only thing of which I'd ask honorable members and the listening public is to keep the Brown family in your thoughts and in your prayers. Make sure you recognize that there are three young men that no longer have their father. There are siblings that need love and healing. And there is a mother who wants um, so desperately to be with her son. And so for us to remember and to recall them and to provide them with the love and support, not only up until next Friday, but thereafter. A lot, as I said, Mr. Speaker, has been said, but I think it's incredibly touching, the comments of which were said by the two senators who spoke last, because I remember Pathways to Status, and I remember speaking to Walton, and Walton said quite plainly and simply, if we do not take action, this will pass. It is because of him it did not. And the country, in my view, and in our view, owes him a tremendous debt of gratitude. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I move that this Honorable House do now adjourn until November 1st. The House stands adjourns to November 1st. November 1st.